Well, salutation, saints. How's everybody doing? He is risen. And to those of you joining online or over at the Mask On service, I just want to say welcome. If you're joining online, I know that there's people all over this morning. Pat Schwab over in Moline, Illinois, I see you and I love you and God is with you in this moment. I know that you and your family are walking through some some difficult times right now, but God is very much with you, and he loves you, and his presence can be as very real in your living room as it is here today. And so if you're joining online, would you just comment a little hand wave emoji or say hello? We're glad that you could be with us. And I'm thankful that through the Holy Spirit, he brings unity to the body of believers. And we are not just gathering with several hundred here today. We are gathering with millions across the world to celebrate that he is king on both sides of the stone. I believe fully with all of my heart, every bone, every fiber within me that Jesus is alive. So uh, I uh, pray that as we celebrate this, Today becomes more than just a celebration. It becomes more than just a traditional meal with grandma and grandpa or mom and dad. But that today, we as a church body, we as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we would experience the very power and presence of our resurrected King. And, And I believe that God wants to demonstrate his power and his presence in a very tangible way this morning. And so before we go any further, uh, if you've just got a need where you're just saying, you know, Pastor Austin, I came in here and I could sure use to be reminded of God's presence in my life, or I could use a demonstration of God's power in my life. Would you just raise your hand with any need this morning? Yeah, there's a lot of hands. Yeah, I just want to pray for you. Just keep your hand up. I just want to pray and then just invite God into this moment. Jesus, right now, you see every hand in this place and the mask on online. You see every need, and you are Lord of them all. And so I pray that a very tangible presence would begin to fill hearts. You'd restore hope and peace where there was none, that you would breathe in your spirit of love and joy for those who need it, that you'd be provider, and you'd provide in the way that only you can provide this morning. So allow us to recognize your power and your presence to a greater capacity this morning. I pray that you would give us eyes to see this morning, ears to hear, and a heart to receive what you have for us. I pray that you would speak through me in exactly the way that you would want to speak through me and and communicate, God, to each and every single individual here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said... Amen, amen. Well, in preparing this sermon, I felt very strongly in my spirit to not preach your typical Easter sermon. So as creative as I can get, my title this morning is not your typical Easter sermon. And while I believe that the tomb is empty, this sermon is not about the empty tomb. This sermon is because there is an empty tomb. What is our proper response to Jesus living today through his resurrection power. I felt strong to preach from John chapter 15, and I I want us to lean into Jesus' words there. So if you've got your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn to John 15. And uh, before we get into 15, we're going to take a look at 14, because 14 through 17 of John, this is Jesus' last day before he's betrayed by his Uh, one of his closest disciples, Judas, right? And then that led to his crucifixion on the cross and his death. And so these 14, 15, 16, 17, these chapters are leading up in the day and the hours right before the crucifixion. And so 14 builds on 15. And this is what Jesus says to his disciples right before our text in 14 in verse one. You can follow along on the screens. Do not let your hearts be troubled. He's, he's, he's right about ready to be crucified, and he knows this. This is on his mind. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you 
also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus was all about places. He left his place in heaven to come to our place on earth, to take our place on the cross, to die a death that was meant for us and to pay the penalty for our sins. And then three days later, he was raised to life and he returned to his place. And he's now preparing for you and I a place in heaven so that someday we can join him forever in heaven. Jesus continues in verse 18 in John 14, and he says to his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. In John 14, Jesus puts it out there and he says that he is the only way to heaven. There is no other God. There is no amount of money. There is no thing that you can do that will get you to heaven. And Jesus says, I am the way. And then in verse 20, Jesus introduces this idea that we are in him and he is in us. Today at the end of my sermon, I'm going to leave time for a response. And I'm going to invite people to get out of their seats and come down to the altar to be reconnected with Christ. I want to be able to pray for you. And if you have other needs, if you've got uh, healing or physical issues or you've got relational issues or you just need more of God, we're going to invite you to come forward. But at the end of the sermon, we're going to have a time of ministry. We're going to have a time of altar where, where we can come forward and say, God, I trust you. I'm calling upon your name. And so I want all of you today to be open to what God is speaking as individuals to you and be open to responding, because this is just simply an outward expression of what's going on on the inside. So would you stand with me as we read our main text, John 15, starting in verse one. Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you re remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You may find your seat this morning. Jesus is speaking to a predominantly Jewish audience right now, and he introduces this idea of himself being the vine. He says, I am the true vine. And that messes with these Jews' theology and framework of thinking. See, in the Old Testament, the vine was a common symbol for Israel. And they believed, the Jews believed, that if you were connected to Israel, you were connected to the vine, which to them was their source of salvation. And Jesus says, not so fast. I am the true vine. There is a new way to heaven, and it is through me and only me. It's not about your nationality. Abide in me. Attach yourself to me. Remain in me. 
And I believe that a large percentage of the people here this morning have heard this message. You know that it's all about Jesus. You know that Jesus is the only way that you can get to heaven. You understand that all of these things can't save you, but I'm afraid that you might relate a little bit to the Jewish community in this time where you're deceived into thinking that you're still connected to the vine, Jesus, when in reality that life-giving vascular connection between you and him has actually slowly been detached. Now, I love living in Iowa. How many are Midwest people through and through, right? Iowa is, is good stuff, right? We got nice people. They're generally uh, good. We've got Casey's Pizza, right? We, uh, we, we don't have fruits and nuts like California has, both literally and figuratively, right? Midwest living is a good place to raise your family. But as I've connected with pastors from across the country, I've realized that pastoring in the Midwest in some ways is more difficult than pastoring in extreme coasts. How am I supposed to convince well-behaved, well-mannered people who generally make good decisions that they are lost in darkness and in need of a savior? Sometimes it's easier to share light into someone's life when it's evident to them that they're in darkness. They are, they are lost and they are in despair. But Iowa is kind of this place and the Midwest is kind of this place where we've got a lot of really good people and by our good decisions and by our good manners, we're able to avoid the major mistakes of life. Thus, and if we were to make them, it would reveal our need, our true need to be in the vine and to be in Jesus Christ. And I'm concerned that there are many people who are well-behaved, well-mannered, and generally make good decisions. And because of that, you feel as if you are somehow connected to Jesus. The fact that your parents never missed a Sunday, the fact that you are faithful to Sunday school, your charitable contributions, your confirmation, your baptism, your, your faithfulness to service, all of these different things mean nothing unless we are connected to the vine. Verse two tells us that God the Father is standing by with a pair of clippers. He's pruning those who bear fruit. I believe that there are many people here today that are in the vine, they are in Jesus, meaning every morning you wake up, you acknowledge your need for God, and you say, God, I need you to flow in my life. Would you reveal in my surroundings the needs that you want me to meet? Would you begin to speak to me in, in the things that I need to do? Would you prune in me and remove my greed? Would you remove my ways of thinking? I just wanna get out of the way, Lord, so that you would lead me. And I believe that God is continuing to prune you. And I would encourage you, if that's you, continue to allow God to prune you. Why? So that you may bear more fruit. Why bear more fruit? So that you can pat yourself on the back and look to your neighbor and say, I'm better than you. No, it's to the Father's glory that you might bear more fruit. But God, the Father, who is the gardener in this passage, is standing by with those same clippers and he's removing branches that do not bear fruit. And those branches are thrown away and they slowly wither, and eventually they are picked up, and they are thrown into the fire. I believe that 2020 was a year of pruning. I 100% respect and understand that there are many who have distanced themselves from social gatherings for health reasons, but we can't ignore the fact that there are many who have slowly and maybe even unknowingly distance themselves from Christ and Christian community. You're willing to go out to eat, but you're not willing to come to church. You're willing to go on vacation, but not join a small group. You watch online, but your phone is in your hand, you're folding laundry and fixing your kids breakfast. Now let me pause a moment because I don't want you to hear that I'm communicating that coming to church physically or joining a small group or anything like that can get you to heaven. Because as many of you know, you can be fully connected 
to the church and still be disconnected to Jesus. Yesterday I went and I bought these roses. And uh, when I got this rose, I snipped the bottom of it and I put them in this vase with a packet of nutrients. And while we observe the beauty of these roses and we can smell the roses and, and, and appreciate it, I think we often forget that these roses are dead. These roses are dead sitting in this vase full of nutrients. If these weren't in this vase, in a day or two it would be wilted up and it, they'd be no good. But these nutrients are just slowing that process down to a week or 10 days or however long. I believe that there might be some here that would relate to that rose where you're not connected to the vine, you're not connected to Jesus, but you're connected to the church. And you come on Sunday and you receive some nutrients and oh, that feels good. And, and you come to church and oh man, worship was just electric today and I just, oh, well, that was good. And you receive some nutrients. You're not genuinely connected to the vine and, and abiding in him on a daily, moment-by-moment -moment basis. And you come to church or your small group and you're deceived into thinking that living is abiding in nutrient-filled water and not in Jesus Christ. I believe that there are three types of people here this morning. The first type of people that are here are, are those who are fully connected to Jesus. Jesus has sealed, he's given you a hunger, he's supernaturally changed your heart, he's pruning you, he's working in your life, he's flowing through you, and, and God sees you, he loves you, and he's pleased with you. I, I ask that you would just stay on guard. Allow yourself to always keep your priorities straight and keep Jesus as the number one love of your life. The second group of people might relate a little bit to this rose. You're a Christian and you know what it's like to be connected to Jesus, but maybe unknowingly through circumstances, through decisions, through whatever, you've slowly become disconnected to the life-giving vine, the very person of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're a Sunday school teacher or a deacon or a pastor or an elder and during this time and this last year, you've been so active, you've been here as soon as we opened the, the doors last end of May, as, as soon as we did Wednesday nights and you've been serving faithfully, you've been doing all these things but you feel exhausted. Could it be that you are receiving nutrients but you're not connected? There could be hundreds of reasons as to why someone is not connected to Jesus. But in this moment, I believe that God is prompting hearts and you're having a realization that I need to be connected to Jesus once again. And I'm gonna ask you to do something very bold. And in a moment, in a little bit, I'm gonna ask you to stand up and come forward down to this altar. That's not a moment to be embarrassed or ashamed. I don't care if it's my dad coming down here. I, I don't care if it's Deacon Dale coming down here. It doesn't matter who you are or how long you've walked with the Lord. That's not a moment to be ashamed. It's a moment to celebrate because there is power in the resurrection blood of Jesus. And I want you to be ready to respond because I believe that God is going to resurrect some people's hearts and shock our hearts back into his rhythm. And the third group of people are people who have never been connected to Jesus. You've never asked Jesus into your life. You've never repented and turned from your sins. See, repentance is more than just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance literally means a 180. In the Greek, the, the idea of the word repentance is to turn 180 degrees. So I'm walking in my ways. I'm walking in my will. I'm doing the things that I want to do. And Jesus says repent. That means turn. And we don't just turn away from sin and, and try to dodge sin. We turn and we run to Jesus. And so maybe you've never given your life to the Lord. Can I just tell you that God loves you? 
He loves you so much that he sent his son from heaven to die in your place so that he could be in a relationship with you. And and if that's you, I'm going to give you an invitation in a little bit to ask Jesus to become Lord of your thoughts, Lord of your heart and your mind, to turn of your ways and invite him to be complete Lord of your life. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes just across this room? Right where you are online, mask on service. Mask on, the same thing goes. As I preach here, I want the response to be the same over there. So we close our eyes in this moment. and We ask that God would speak to us. What group do you resonate? Are you fully connected? Have you unknowingly been disconnected and you've just need some reattachment from the gardener or maybe you've never asked what group do you identify with this morning so Jesus would you speak to our hearts would you reveal our spiritual condition in this moment help us Lord speak to us Jesus open your eyes if you've never asked Jesus into your heart I'm going to talk to you in just a moment but right now I'm going to talk to all the Christians in the room all of the people that have made a decision to follow Christ there is nothing that you can do that will reattach yourself to God It has to be a supernatural change in your heart. And the only proper response to today's message, to to this word that Jesus is talking about, is crying out to God. Saying, Jesus, by the same power that, that raised you from death to life, I need that same power in my life. Because in my goodness... In my desire, I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. It becomes such a burden. And so, Jesus, I need you to bring me to life. Lord, I need you. Every minute, I need you. Every moment, I need you. In the morning, God, I need you. Would you attach yourself to me? Would you seal my love for you? Would you begin to birth a hunger and a thirst in me? I need you every moment, God. So if you identified in that middle group, you said, man, Pastor Austin, holding up these flowers is just like right on my heart's door. I'm going to ask you on the count of three to get up with every eye open, come down to this altar, and we're going to celebrate the fact that God is bringing people to life. One, two, three. Would you get up right now if that's you and you'd say, I need to come to life. This is not a moment of shame. This is not a moment of guilt. This is a moment that is powerful between them and God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you that you are a restorative God. Thank you that you are a merciful God, that you're not concerned with what we've done or where we're at, but where we're headed. And so I thank you in this moment, Jesus, in this holy moment, I pray that you would begin to raise people back to life, God, that you'd begin to seal your love for them in their hearts and and you begin to create in them a hunger and a desire and a thirst to be with you, to abide in you, that they would bear fruit for your glory, Jesus. Help us, Lord. 
Help us, Jesus. Help us, God. And I want to talk to those who haven't accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. If that's you and you say, Pastor Austin, I want to ask Jesus into my heart for the first time in my life. Would you just raise your hand right now and, and make eye contact with me? Just, yeah, I see you. Yeah. Is there anyone else? Would you pray this prayer with me? Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry for what I've done, but I'm thankful for what you've done. Change my heart, change my thinking, and place in me a new heart for you. I love you, Jesus, and today I decide to follow you. Amen. Would you all stand with me? If you would like prayer for any reason, maybe, maybe you like, oh man, I, I so wanted to go with that second group of people. I just couldn't do it. Whatever the reason is, would you come forward? The pastors are gonna be up here. We're gonna pray for everyone that comes forward. If you come up here, we're gonna pray for you and we're gonna believe that God is going to bring people to life. God, we need you. Every hour, we need you. Help us, Jesus. Help us, God. Help us, Lord. Thank you for what you have done today. And I pray that you would set us on a course that we would bear much fruit for your glory and your kingdom that all might know that every tongue confess, every knee bow, that you are the risen Lord, the one true God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Only Jesus, by his resurrection power, can place in you a heart that can live for him. It's exhausting without it. So I pray that you guys would live in the proper response of our resurrected King.